wanted to welcome Dick Kohler. Uh, Dick, I've known, but not as long as you've been a member of the Historical Society. Dick's a longtime member of the Town of Clinton Historical Society, and he will be giving a, a Zoom session tonight uh, with a review of transportation through the ages, uh, particularly railroads that were here in the Hudson Valley. Dick's interest uh, originated in his hometown of Shenandoah, Pennsylvania, back in 1945, which was served by three busy freight train uh, using coal burning steam locomotives. That's why I know so much about that. <laughs> the changing practices of railroads were nowhere uh, more evident than in the part of Pennsylvania, his part of Pennsylvania, and in the Hudson Valley. Dick retired after working for several manufacturing firms as an electrical engineer, getting his BS uh, in electrical engineering from Penn State back in 1958. He has been active with Walkway Over the Hudson since its inception. So when you go on the walkway, think of Dick. So I, I'd like to welcome Dick Kohler. Go ahead, Dick. Uh, thank you, Barbara. I'm happy to be here. My uh, interest tonight, or what I'd like to talk about is my overview of how mankind has compensated for the uneven distribution of natural resources on the earth. Uh, for example, coal, petroleum, iron ore, building materials, and even pineapples and avocados uh, are produced in relatively remote locations and have to be uh, brought to their markets. <clears throat> this has always been a huge expenditure of labor and material, whether by human backpack, by water transport, or animal-driven transport. Now, railroads have vastly improved the uh, overland movement of material and people. So, the origin, the origin of railroads in the Hudson Valley began more than 200 years ago. Uh, Robert Fulton, originally from near Lancaster, Pennsylvania, traveled extensively in Europe and New York to gather support uh, for his concept, his concept being a uh, steam-driven boat <laughs> um, to compete with the wind-driven boats or sailboats of his time. Uh, in 1807, he did pioneer. Hang slide. On. Say again. You want the slide? Yes, please uh, go to one. I got ahead of myself. It's just going. You want the next it's one? It's coming, folks. <laughs> Here we are. <clears throat> this uh, slide depicts uh, a representation of uh, uh, one of the earliest uh, wind driven or uh, uh, steam-driven uh, boats uh, on the Hudson River. I don't think it's an accurate representation of any one particular boat, but it gives you an idea. Uh, now, Robert Fulton pioneered the first, with his first steamboat uh, called the North River. Uh, that is, he named it after the river, which was called the North River at the time. We know it as the Hudson River, uh, but professional boatmen still call it the North River to distinguish it from the East River in, on the other side of Manhattan. Um, several years later, a true New Yorker, Peter Cooper, uh, designed and built this locomotive called the Tom Thumb. Uh, for a demonstration. He built it apparently uh, strictly for, uh, for a demonstration of the capabilities of a, a steam-driven 
uh, conveyance compared with the horse-drawn conveyance. The B and O, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was using horse-drawn carriages to uh, move people and material around in the Baltimore area. Peter Cooper's concept was a steam-driven device to do the same thing. Uh, in other words, an advance from uh, steam-driven river boats. What we have here is two parallel tracks laid down. One uh, had the horse pulling two carriages on it, and the other one had Peter Cooper's uh, machine, steam driven, pulling two carriages. They were lined up and uh, uh, at the signal to go, they, uh, the idea had been to race the two of them um, and see who won the race. Uh, the horse, I believe, one thing I read, was given a head start, but the uh, steam-driven Tom Thumb caught up eventually as it filled up steam and beat the horse for a little while, and then something broke on the Tom Thumb, and the uh, locomotive stopped, and the horse won the race. Uh, however, the demonstration was sufficient to tell the Baltimore and Ohio people that this was uh, where they were going. Uh, where we were going with the uh, uh, locomotives. Uh, same year, uh, 1870, um, a locomotive was built at the worst, and at the uh, Cold Spring, no, I'm sorry, at the West Point Foundry in New York City. Uh, this is the first locomotive designed to build to successfully haul passengers, and that was for the Charleston and Hamburg Railroad in West Virginia, in South Carolina, excuse me, in December 1830. This is... That's the race. Oh, right. Here we go. <coughs> Um, there's a much more sophisticated looking device uh, built for commercial purposes by the West Point Foundry in New York City. Um, it worked very well until the firemen tied down the safety valve and the boiler exploded. However, again, the, uh, the concept was shown to be successful. Uh, you could uh, uh, haul freight uh, by burning wood and uh, instead of using horses. Um, it proved the concept of the flanged iron wheel, as you see, um, on the iron rail. Well, after that, the country went crazy for railroads. This was starting in 1830. Uh, every city and town in the country had to have its railroad to get from here to there. And the railroads became a uh, vast uh, investment opportunity for Americans and uh, for English uh, investors. In fact, railroads were probably overbuilt by quite a bit. Um, back to the, the foundry that built this uh, locomotive. The West Point foundry later moved to uh, Cold Spring, uh, across from West Point, kept the name and produced cannon for the uh, uh, Northern Army during the Civil War. Became quite famous for that. <laughs> this was a early attempt at using steam-driven locomotives for passenger duty. Uh, apparently, these carriages were fabricated from stagecoaches and, to my mind, not very comfortable travel uh, sitting in the open air like that. And, <laughs> but uh, one more step in the evolution of passenger cars. <clears throat> this is the Kingston Terminal 
uh, known as the Roundout on the Hudson River, uh, where coal was brought from uh, the coal fields of Pennsylvania on the Delaware and Hudson Canal. Uh, canals uh, were the competition, the biggest competition for railroads at the time. And the Erie Canal had opened, what, 1816 or so? The D&H opened about 1825, and they were successful uh, for their stated purpose. Uh, the, the railroads had to get in there and compete. The, uh, the D&H, uh, here's a picture of a freight train crossing the uh, bridge at, um, Rosendale across the river. And the water underneath is the DNH Canal, uh, which uh, didn't last too much longer. Even after it stopped hauling coal uh, from Pennsylvania, it was used locally to take, for example, cement uh, down to the river, meaning the Hudson River, for transport everywhere. The cement produced in Rosendale was very popular uh, as a uh, high quality cement at the time. So the DNH Canal continued on with that function. But in the meantime, the railroad took over uh, most of its traffic as depicted here. The bridge that the train is on uh, was the earliest bridge at that point over the uh, Roundout Creek. Uh, today, the newest bridge is part of a rail trail in uh, Ulster County. Another source of competition for the railroads in the late uh, 1800s was the uh, Hudson River uh, steamboats, the side wheelers. They were extremely luxurious vessels. They could carry thousands of people. Uh, some had live entertainment during the day and evening. Uh, they provided service. There were night boats and day boats, uh, and many of them, and they uh, varied in their schedules. And you could uh, uh, pick what time you wanted to arrive in Albany or New York City, depending on which way you were going or any intermediate uh, stop. Uh, very popular, but slow. The uh, railroads had it all over the uh, riverboats so far as time, uh, time and transit. Uh, the inset down in the lower right shows the Poughkeepsie Railroad Bridge uh, sometime after 1800, uh, 1906, excuse me, uh, when it had been rebuilt. Uh, <clears throat> it just depicts what was taken over uh, from uh, the river boats and other forms of transportation. We have here the epitome of steam locomotives in 1865. This is the locomotive that drew Abraham Lincoln's funeral train around uh, the country, the northern part of the country, uh, to take him to Springfield to be buried after he was killed. Uh, the locomotive was uh, the epitome of uh, technological advance up to that point, uh, even though it still had uh, the very big smokestack that meant uh, that it burnt wood for fuel, <laughs> had not been uh, changed to coal. But uh, notice the, the very high, uh, the very large diameter uh, drive wheels, which were designed for speed at the time. Abraham Lincoln's funeral uh, car, a huge car for the time built by uh, George Pullman. Uh, very ornate, an awful lot of wheels on it. It made the Pullman Company's name. Uh, it was very large. Some stations along the route had to be somewhat rebuilt and platforms moved in order to get the car by the station. Uh, that train went through Poughkeepsie uh, 
1865 and created quite a stir. People came from all over to uh, uh, pay homage to Abraham Lincoln. What, what did I do? I was trying, there we go. There's another view of that funeral car. The Lincoln pin coupler. This was the mechanism by which railroad cars were connected uh, for many decades. They uh, were simply a bunch of parts that had to be assembled whenever two cars were uh, coupled together or disassembled when the cars were dis uh, rerouted, we'll say. A brakeman had to get in between the cars and pull the pins apart, find the link and tuck it someplace. And all these chains uh, hanging around were to keep parts from getting lost. Uh, extremely drain dangerous. The uh, brakeman had to get in between the cars, somehow signal to the engineer to move the train one way or the other, not too hard, not too, and get it within a couple inches and, a very precise operation, very difficult and very dangerous. Uh, for decades, the uh, 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 mechanical geniuses of the time <coughs> excuse me, tried to find something better. And it wasn't until uh, Eli Janney in 1875 did come up with a, a better method called the uh, automatic coupler <clears throat> and which did not require uh, being between the cars and, but it took 25 years before Congress uh, the, the federal Congress required these couplers on all railroad cars so that one took a long time some other major safety advances that occurred but took a long time were uh, the air brake developed by uh, our own George Westinghouse and the telegraph by uh, Samuel, Samuel Morse. Uh, big advances in safety on the railroads. What I have with, I have here is a map of Pennsylvania, a very simplified map of Pennsylvania. It shows the present routing of the Pennsylvania Turnpike from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. That route was laid out in the 1880s by uh, the forces of Cornelius Vanderbilt, who was trying to uh, build a competing railroad for the Pennsylvania Railroad. The two railroads were in uh, great competition with each other. Uh, at the time, the Pennsylvania Railroad was actually building the West Shore Railroad, just on the other side of the Hudson River from us uh, in Ulster County and from Selkirk uh, near Albany down to Weehawken in New Jersey. The intention being a railroad to compete with the uh, New York Central, which was Vanderbilt's railroad. Um, <coughs> Vanderbilt wasn't happy with the idea of a competing railroad a mile away on the other shore of the Hudson River. So they, his forces were busily uh, cutting tunnels through the hills of Pennsylvania, nine or 10 of them. I shouldn't call them hills, they were mountains of, Pens of Western Pennsylvania and laying out the, the roadbed for this entire 300 foot, uh, sorry, 300 mile route between the two. Um, uh, J.P. Morgan got wind of this, uh, and he regarded this as a very wasteful exercise on the part of the Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central Railroad. So using his leverage, he forced the two railroads to trade properties. That is, the Pennsylvania Railroad gave the West Shore Line to the um, to the New York Central, and the New York Central gave the South Pennsylvania Railroad to the Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, and everything settled down. The uh, West Shore Railroad continued in service 
but under really the control of the New York Central, the South Pennsylvania Railroad was abandoned approximately 1885. Uh, 50 years later, the state of Pennsylvania uh, Highway Department got wind of this old graded right of way complete with tunnels through the hills. The uh, Turnpike Commission took over the uh, right of way and built the Pennsylvania. What did I do wrong? There we go, the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Uh, <clears throat> so you could. The re possibly one of the reasons why the Pennsylvania Turnpike became uh, so successful so early on in 1939 was that much of the work had been done whenever 45, so, uh, uh, many years before by uh, uh, <laughs> the uh, New York Central Railroad. A uh, scene of a typical station A train waiting for passengers. Uh, this is what you would have in 1945, uh, more or less. A great deal of smoke and steam and noise uh, around the station while awaiting passengers. Not a comfortable environment. <laughs> Structures like this were stationed every so often along the uh, tracks of the New York Central. They stored coal uh, for the steam-driven locomotives and water was brought to the locomotives. The locomotives used a tremendous amount of water, that water to be turned into steam uh, approximated four times the weight of the coal that was burned uh, to produce the steam. Uh, the New York Central obtained its water from track pans uh, there's none showing here, but they were literally pans, watertight pans in between the rails. And as the locomotives went by, they scooped up water and directed it into the tenders. And the reason was uh, so that the trains didn't have to stop too frequently to get water. Coal was one thing, water was another. Those track pans, as soon as diesels came on the scene, those track pans disappeared instantly. Uh, um, this map shows railroad activity or rail, railroad rights of way in Dutchess County. Every town in Dutchess had a railroad presence. And Dutchess, uh, well, Quinton was no exception. You see, in the southeastern corner of uh, Clinton, uh, you had two different railroads running through. Uh, there was actually a freight station from one of them, just uh, about a quarter mile from where we're sitting. Uh, farmers would bring their milk to that location to put it on a train to be taken down to uh, New York City via Poughkeepsie. Uh, there were passenger trains running back and forth on uh, all of these lines. Uh, there were 10, I believe, <laughs> here we go. There were 10 different known railroads present in uh, Dutchess County in the 1880s. <clears throat> Most of them have gone out of business. There were various mergers and bankruptcies and takeovers and what have you over the years uh, under other names, all of which were later abandoned. And today, only the New York Central's old roadbeds are still in use. Uh, and they're used by Amtrak, Metro North, and CSX. We have the Harlem Valley, <coughs> excuse me, 
branch of um, Metro North, and we have the um, Hudson line. Uh, everything else is gone. There's a typical small locomotive, uh, coal burning, that would have been used on these uh, secondary feeder lines. Again, <laughs> very noisy and smoky. There's a typical passenger train on the Hudson line in the 40s. Doching smoke and steam. A map of the remaining lines uh, on, near the Hudson River. The, uh, the Harlem line and the Hudson line. And there's actually a line that runs uh, from New Jersey up over to uh, Port Jervis. Uh, frequent trains uh, from Port Jervis to uh, the Hudson River. Um, the advent of steam, I'm sorry, the advent of diesel in approximately 1946 on the uh, Hudson line. Still some, still some smoke, some exhaust from the, the diesel, but not as much. There's a later generation of uh, long distance uh, a train on the Hudson line. And here's what we have today. Uh, typical diesel locomotive that might run into Grand Central, uh, might start, uh, may, might stop at Harmon and uh, trade locomotives. Um, just uh, run down on some of the named coaches. Metro North names its coaches and if you go down to one of the stations, you'll see that they uh, uh, paint the uh, name of the coach on every one of them. There's quite a bunch of them. Some people track those. There's a typical named for the Brass City. I'm not sure what was the Brass, uh, brass City, excuse me. Here's a one line diagram uh, showing Metro North emanating from Grand Central Terminal, crossing uh, the Hudson River to Hoboken, Spring Valley, and Port Jervis, and going due north uh, up here along the Hudson. And oh, oh there's also the, the New Haven. Uh, branch. Okay. So that's what's become of the uh, railroad uh, network in uh, the Hudson Valley. Here's more named coaches. This is satellite. Not really a satellite, but uh, the Hudson Valley railroads uh, transport many millions of people daily, if we count the uh, subways in New York City. They all come under the same management, the, uh, uh, the MTA. Uh, and there's buses, subways, Metro North, uh, Long Island Railroad and Central of New Jersey, I believe. <clears throat> uh, the subways alone still, even with the pandemic, the subways are still transporting about 6 million people a day. That's uh, an unbelievable number. But uh, little known, fact, factual, uh, busiest in... Uh, People mover in the country. Do you know what was going Okay. Um, all the other lines transport as, much, as many as a million people uh, per day. Most of them into and out of Penn Station and Grand Central Terminal. <laughs>